if you have your Bibles, I want you to go with me to John chapter number 7. In John chapter number 7, verses number 37, it said in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. If you're a believer, you should receive the Holy Ghost. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. John chapter number 7 verse 39 says, For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. But guess what? Since then the Holy Ghost has been poured out. And the Holy Ghost is still being poured out. And I've come to tell somebody in this house today, it can be poured out in this place today on you, and you can have the Holy Ghost today. And I've come to preach to you this morning the reason you need the Holy Ghost. The reason you need the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's pray together this morning. Holy God, we're asking you this morning, as we begin to preach and deliver the word of the Lord, I pray that there would be a thirst that is stirred up in hearts this morning. I pray, God, that there would be a hunger, Lord, that refuses to be quenched until your spirit falls in their life. I pray that there would be an opening of the understanding this morning for the need, God, to receive the power of your precious promise, which is the Holy Ghost. And God, I'm going to give you praise for it this morning. And everybody say, in Jesus' name, amen. And if you're going to help me preach this morning, then you can be seated. Hallelujah. The reason you need the Holy Ghost. I've had some people ask me through the years, do I have to have the Holy Ghost to make it to heaven? That's really not a good question. I guess it could be. But really what you should be asking is, do I get to receive the Holy Ghost? Because once you've ever received the Holy Ghost, you understand that the Holy Ghost is the greatest gift that's been poured out on mankind. There's nothing better in this world than the Holy Ghost. There's not a drug that you can put in your veins, that you can snort through your nose, that you can smoke through your mouth. There's not a liquid that you can drink through uh, your mouth that will make you feel better than receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh, there's nothing in this world that feels any better than coming down to an altar and having your sins lifted and once those sins are lifted off of you through repentance the power of the Spirit of God falls on you and you begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives the other and somebody said there's no high like the most high and I'm here to second that this morning I just wonder if there's anybody that's got the Holy Ghost already in this house that can second what I'm saying that there's nothing any better than receiving the power of the Holy Ghost in your life today hallelujah the reason you need the Holy Ghost but the answer the question that many ask do I have to have the Holy Ghost for salvation the first point I do want to make this morning is the Holy Ghost is necessary for salvation now, I'm not preaching to you my doctrine. I'm not preaching to you the doctrine of the United Pentecostal Church. We're going to look at what God's Word says. Because when it's all said and done, you're not going to be judged by what I preach to you. You mean really, Pastor? All right. 
You're not going to be judged before God by what I preach. You're not going to be judged by the UPC manual. You're going to be judged by this right here. And so that's why we're going to stay in the book. So if you have your Bibles out this morning. John chapter number 3, verse number 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He was a religious ruler. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art our teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus just cut to the chase. He didn't have time for all that small talk. He didn't have time for flattery. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, pay attention, pay attention. I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except. A man be born of the water and of the spirit. And notice that word spirit there we talked about last week. That if the word spirit in the word of God has a big S, it's talking about the spirit of God or the Holy Ghost. Small S is talking about other spirits. Except a man be born of the water. That's going down into this watery grave in baptism. And of the spirit. That's receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He said, except you do that. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's pretty plain. I think anybody that's got an open mind can read that and understand that Jesus is saying, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you ain't going. Now, I didn't say that. Jesus said that. And then just to clarify so that Nicodemus wouldn't get confused. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. There are some people that want to try to teach you that being born of the water is when you're born in the natural and your mother's water breaks. That don't hold two ounces of water in the Scripture. It's just not there. We can talk over and over again about being born of the water is baptism. It's very plain and clear in the Scripture, and we see it repeated over and over again through the book of Acts. And so Jesus didn't want Nicodemus to be confused. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. All that stuff that went on when you were born into this natural world has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, Nicodemus. Because that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell where it comes from. Or where it goes, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So it's very plain. Jesus said, except a man be born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Romans chapter number 8, verse 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Well, if you don't belong to him, how are you going to go to heaven with him? We're talking about why you need the Holy Ghost. It is necessary for salvation. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 37, after Peter had preached unto the multitude on the day of Pentecost, they said, and men and brethren, what shall we do? We've got this conviction in our heart. They were pricked in their heart. Conviction rested upon them. They realized that they've sinned. They've made a mistake. They've, they went contrary to God's word. They've, they've messed up. And now they've got this problem on their hands. And they said, what are we going to do about it? And then Peter said unto them, repent. And be baptized, every one of you. See, there's that water. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission or the washing away of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There it is. There's that formula that Jesus was talking about in John chapter number 3. Except the man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And now Jesus 
or Peter is preaching exactly what Jesus was trying to convey to Nicodemus. So is the Holy Ghost necessary for salvation? I would say unto you, yes, it's very necessary. Because I want to ask you this question, can you be saved without believing? Can you be saved without believing? No, absolutely not. Everybody agrees with that. Hebrews 11 and 6, But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so everybody believes that believing is a part of the process. Now you say, Brother Arby, what does this have to do with the Holy Ghost? Just hang with me and we're going to tie it all together. And so without faith it's impossible to please him. Now let's go to the Roman road of salvation that people want to call it. And let's just see what it says and look at what it really says. Romans chapter number 10 verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But it didn't say that you were saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That word believeth means is there's a process that a continual process until you reach what you're believing for is something that don't stop. See, really, we say that once we receive the Holy Ghost that we're saved. But but in reality, that's not true. Because in reality, we're not really saved until we hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Until then, we're really just in the process of being saved. Because if salvation was a one-time experience, that you can come down to the altar and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you got a guaranteed ticket to heaven. But we know that that's not true because I've seen people over and over again come down, have an experience with God, turn around, walk out the doors, and you never see them again. Are those people saved? I would say that they're not. So in reality, we're saved. We're being saved, and we're going to be saved. It's a process. Just like believing is a process. It's not a one-time thing. And so when you began to believe, you got to continue to believe until you attain. That's why Jesus said in John chapter number 7, He that believeth on me as the Scripture has said. You see, there's different levels of believing. There's a lot of people in this world that believe that there is a God, but their belief is not bringing them unto salvation. And so you, your belief has to grow and mature until you get to the point that you obtain salvation and then you continue to walk in that plan of salvation that God has for you until you hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. See, that believing causes you to continue to be faithful. So that's why it says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. How do you think that is? I can tell you how that is. It's more than saying, Jesus, I believe in you. It's when the Holy Ghost falls on you and you begin to speak with other tongues. Where do you speak with other tongues from? From your mouth. That's when confession is made unto salvation. Is when the Holy Ghost falls on you and you begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives you utterance. You say, Brother Irby, you can't say that. Well, yes, I can because the Bible says so. Let's just keep reading. 1 Corinthians 12 and 3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus as cursed. And no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Hmm. Confession is made unto salvation. But 1 Corinthians 12 and 3 says you can't confess that He's Lord without the Holy Ghost. So we're talking about Believing and confession and all that good stuff and how it all goes together. Mark 16 and 15, and he said unto thee, go, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. 
In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. John chapter number 7, verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Number one reason why you need the Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost is necessary for salvation. Except a man be born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. The second reason you need the Holy Ghost is you receive power when you receive the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter number 1 verse number 8, But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. I don't know about you, but I want to have the power of God working in my life. Hallelujah. I want His presence moving in my life and I want Him to empower me. Hallelujah. There's people in this world that wonder why they have such trouble living for God when they haven't received the Holy Ghost yet. I can tell you why. Because when you receive the Holy Ghost, you receive power. What kind of power? Power for what? Power to become. Power to live. Power to overcome. Power to do everything that you need to do. Listen, listen to what John 1 and 11 said. He said He came unto his own and his own received him not but as many as received him what is that talking about when you receive the Holy Ghost to them gave he power to become the sons of God you know why you're having trouble becoming a son of God sometimes because you haven't received the power to become that I heard somebody the other day say this and make this statement they said um, the only way to become a donkey is to be born one Well, guess what? The only way to become a Christian is to be born one. But as many as received him, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but they were born of God. It's not something that you have the power to do within yourself. It's a supernatural thing when you're born and filled with the Holy Ghost. Luke 9 and 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils. Anybody, any, anybody want power over the devil? I do. He gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Sounds like a really good reason to have the Holy Ghost to me. Luke 10 and 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Power. Acts 6 and 8 And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Matthew chapter number 10 verse 7 As you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely have you received, freely give. So the second reason you need the Holy Ghost is you receive power when you receive it. You know, we're, we're kind of living in a generation where we want to apply all these scriptures that I read in this, section, this second section to the pastor. The pastor's the one that's got that authority. The pastor's the one that's got that power. The pastor's the one that lay hands on the sick. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you're a believer filled with the Holy Ghost, you have the power to do those things. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you receive the power to do that. You say, well, pastor, how come it's not happening in my life? You receive the power, but you've got to learn how to operate in the dimension of faith that unlocks it. There's different dimensions of faith. And so you've got to grow and mature in your faith. That, that's why I press us so much to pray and press us so much to read our Bible. Why? 
Because the word of the Lord says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Then in Jude 20, it says, Beloved, building up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said that this kind of faith goeth not out but by fasting and prayer. So there's a deadly triple threat to the devil. Fasting, prayer, and the word of God. And when you implement those three things in your life, what happens is your faith begins to grow and mature. And so you begin to operate in a different level of maturity in the spirit. And God begins to release that power in you as you're able to mature and grow in it. Because you don't give a three-year-old a 357 to play with. Because he's not mature enough and capable of handling that kind of power. What do you give him? You give him a squirt pistol and you say, now you don't point this at this and this is the way you handle it. And you teach him how to operate in that dimension and then he grows a little bit more and matures a little bit. You know what? It works the same way in the spirit. The reason why people aren't released in the dimensions of the Holy Ghost is because they're not mature enough to handle that type of power. Because I don't know if you realize it or not, but there's some men in the Old Testament that operated in the dimension of power that I'm talking about, and, and it didn't always turn out well for their enemies. Some of their enemies were cursed, and they died, and they were smote with blindness. And, and so if, if God released the power that's in you fully to operate in it without you being mature, and you not have control of your tongue, then you're going to speak something and because you spoke it and you're operating in that power it's going to come to pass and it may not be good for somebody that's around you. So God begins to release the gifts of the Spirit to people when they become mature enough to handle them in a positive manner in spite of the way they may be feeling at the moment. So there's power when you receive the Holy Ghost. And the third reason why you need the Holy Ghost is there's power of restoration in the Holy Ghost. Joel chapter number 2 verse 23 Be glad then ye children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God for he hath given you the former rain moderately and he will cause to come down for you the rain the former rain and the latter rain in the first month and the floors shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil and I will restore I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I'm in the midst of Israel and I am the Lord your God. And none else in my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions and upon my servants and handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. You see, when you've been living in sin, it's a dry, dead, and barren place. I know because I lived there. All of us have lived there. Because the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. <clears throat> and I know how dry my life was, how dead, how barren I was. You know, as a young man, 15 years old, living in sin, you're, you, you don't even feel like you have a purpose in life. You're just floating along and drifting. And, and you're filled with so much emptiness and so much barrenness and so much dryness. But when the Holy Ghost comes, there's a refreshing rain that ends the spiritual drought in your life. Life begins to spring up where there was death. I, I, I can remember before I got the Holy Ghost. People said I just walked around with this mean scowl on my face all the time. I was only in eighth grade. And I remember seniors talking to them years later. Says, man, we were scared of you. You look like you was mad at the world and ready to kill everybody. And that's because I was. I didn't like my life. I didn't like anything about my life. I was, I was an empty, barren, wounded, and angry young man. But there's just something about the Holy Ghost. I've seen it happen over and over again. Somebody walks into the house of God 
And they've got one expression on their face. And when the Holy Ghost falls, there's just a transition of your expression. It's just one of the things that just almost comes natural with receiving the Holy Ghost. All of a sudden you go from... to. It just puts a smile on your face. My, my pastor used to always say, if you've got the Holy Ghost, you need to tell your face. Because when you got the Holy Ghost, the Bible says it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. There's a peace that comes along with having the Holy Ghost. I, I can remember as a, as a young man without the Holy Ghost, there was a fear in my life. There was no peace there. I would lay in my bed at night and every noise outside my window would startle me. I would be afraid. But there was just something that came over me. There was a boldness that came over me when I got the Holy Ghost. I was still a little guy, but I felt like David, send the lion on my way. I'll take him on, pull his head off. We'll feed him. We'll make him a honey beehive. Even though that was Samson that done that. But David killed a lion too. There's just something about when the Holy Ghost comes. It restores faith to you. It restores peace to you. It restores life to you. It restores, you see, why? Because the Bible says that the enemy comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. And he does a good job at it. He'll steal your hopes and your dreams. He'll kill your relationships. He'll destroy your family. He'll destroy your faith. He'll destroy your finances. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I like that old gospel song that says, I just started living. When you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that's the day that you just started living. There's just something about when you receive the Holy Ghost, there's a fresh breath of life that's breathed into you. Before then, you're like that old dead, dry army that was in Ezekiel 37 that was just some old dead, dry bones. But when God's Word begins to put your life back together and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost breathes on you, there's just something on the inside that perks up and stands up and you've got a new lease on life because there is a restriction storing power that comes over you when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because after all, isn't the gospel the death, the burial, and the resurrection? Why do you think he wanted you to have the Holy Ghost? He wants you to die at an altar. He wants you to get buried in baptism. But he don't want you to stay as a dead man. He wants to raise you up to the newness of life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things have come new. There's just something that happens in your life when you receive the Holy Ghost. I've watched... I've watched people's lives that were just strung out on drugs and it looked like they had one foot in the grave and the other one on a banana peel. And at any minute, they were going to leave this world. And you thought, there is no way. And all of a sudden, somebody witnesses to them and invites them to the house of God. And God begins to deal with their heart and they find their way to an altar and repent of their sin. And in six months' time, after they receive the Holy Ghost, you look at them and you wouldn't even think it's the same person. There's just a life that's come back into them. There's a smile on their face. There's a different glow about them. They don't have that old dark look of spirit that's on them anymore. They've been delivered and set free. I'm coming to tell somebody in this house this morning, God can do the same thing for you. He can give you the Holy Ghost, pour it out on you. He can transform and change your life and you can become a new creature this morning. Yes, you need the Holy Ghost to be saved. But I'm telling you this morning, the question to ask is not do I have to have the Holy Ghost. The question to ask is, do I get to get the Holy Ghost? We're talking about something that has power. We're talking about something that gives you strength to overcome. 
We're talking about God, not just... He told His disciples, He said, I'm with you now. He said, but I'm going to go away that I may come again and be in you. That's what the Holy Ghost is, is it's Christ in you. The hope of glory. Woo! And then the Bible says that same quickening Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if it dwell in your mortal body, shall raise you up. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for a day when I'm doing my rapture exercises and all of a sudden it's not an exercise anymore. I I jump that little one inch that I'm capable of jumping and one day the Lord's going to take over and I'm just going to sail on out of here. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to give him some praise this morning. I just wonder if there's anybody in this place that's excited that they've got the Holy Ghost. Let's all stand together today. The reason you need the Holy Ghost is because it's necessary for salvation. You receive power when you get it. And it has the power to restore your life. It's the greatest gift that God's ever poured out on mankind. It'll do more for you. It'll do for you what your mom and dad can't do for you. It'll do for you what a counselor can't do for you. It can do for you what Alcoholics Anonymous can't do for you. I've watched people go through the 12-step program or 10 steps or however many steps it is. And this is the problem with those programs. They're telling you that once you're an alcoholic, you're always one. But I don't like that. I like what the Bible says. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. I'm not an alcoholic no more when the Holy Ghost comes on me. I'm a new creature. I'm not a drug addict anymore when the Holy Ghost comes on me. I'm a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. I'm just curious if there's a group of people that would be willing for the next few moments to lift up your hands, uh, lift up your voice, and begin to magnify the name of the Lord. I'm wondering if there's the church of the living God that's in this place this morning uh, that would be willing to begin to pray and seek the face of God for some that may come this morning looking for what you've already received. Hallelujah.